a prison in South Africa, 1990. Nelson Mandela is released, emerges after 27 years of imprisonment, fighting against racism, poverty, and inequality. He rises to become president of the African National Congress and receives the Nobel Peace Prize. His life is the story of a hero, of a man who changed the world. Read Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. A Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela. Apart from my life, a strong constitution and an abiding connection to the Thembu Royal House, the only thing my father bestowed upon me at birth was a name, Roli Slaushla. In Kosa, Roli Slaushla literally means pulling the branch of a tree, but its colloquial meaning more accurately would be troublemaker. I do not believe that names are destiny or that my father somehow divined my future, but in later years, friends and relatives would ascribe to my birth name the many storms I have both caused and weathered. My more familiar English or Christian name was not given to me until my first day of school, but I am getting ahead of myself. I was born on the 18th of July, 1918, in Meviso, a tiny village on the banks of the Mimbashe River in the district of Umtata, the capital of Transki. The year of my birth marked the end of the Great War. The outbreak of an influenza epidemic that killed millions throughout the world and the visit of a delegation of the African National Congress to the Versailles Peace Conference to voice the grievances of the African people of South Africa. Mvezo, however, was a place apart, a tiny precinct removed from the world of great events, where life was lived much as it had been for hundreds of years. The Transki, in 800 miles east of Cape Town, 550 miles south of Johannesburg, and lies between the Kai River and the natal border. Between the rugged Drakensburg Mountains to the north and blue waters of the Indian Ocean to the east, it is a beautiful country of rolling hills, fertile valleys, and a thousand rivers and streams, which keep the landscape green even in winter. The Transki used to be one of the largest territorial divisions within South Africa, covering an area of the size of Switzerland, with a population of about three and a half million Kosas and a tiny minority of Basotos and Whites. It is home to the Thembu people, who are part of the Kosa nation, of which I am a member. My father, Gadla Henry Mapankinyaswa, was a chief of both blood and custom. He was confirmed as chief of Mezvo, Mavizo, by the king of Thembu tribe. But under British rule, his selection had to be ratified by the government, which in Mavizo took the form of the local magistrate. As a government-appointed chief, he was eligible for a stipend as well as a portion of the fees the government levied on the community for vaccination of livestock and communal grazing land. Although the role of chief was a venerable and esteemed one, it had, even 75 years ago, become debased by the control of an unsympathetic white government. The Thembu tribe reaches back for 20 generations to King Zwide. According to tradition, the Thembu people lived in the foothills of the Drakensburg Mountains and migrated toward the coast in the 16th century, where they were incorporated with the Kosa nation. The Kosa are part of the, Nungu, the Nunguni people who have lived, hunted, and fished in the rich, temperate southeastern region of South Africa, between the Great Interior Plateau to the north and the Indian Ocean to the south, since at least the 11th century. The Nunguni can be divided into a northern group, the Zulu and the Swazi people, and a southern group, which is made up of Amabaka, Amaboyana, and Amagaleke, Amalfingu, Amamundomis, Amamampando, Abasota, Abatembu, and together they compromise the Kosu nation, the Kosa nation. The Kosa are a proud and patrilineal people with an expressive and euphonious language and an abiding belief in the importance of laws, education, and courtesy. 
The Cosa society was a balanced and harmonious social order in which every individual knew his or her place. Each Cosa belongs to a clan that traces its descents back to a specific forefather. I am a member of the Madiba clan, named after Thimbu chief who ruled in the Transki in the 18th century. I am often addressed as Madiba, my clan name, a term of respect. Naguben Kuka, one of the greatest monarchs who united the Thembu tribe, died in 1832. As was the custom, he had wives from the principal royal houses. The great house, from which the heir is selected, the right-hand house, and the exiba, a minor house that is referred to by some as the left-hand house. It was a task of the sons of the exiba or the left-hand house to settle royal disputes. Mitri Krakra, the eldest son of the great house, succeeded ne Neguben Kuku, and amongst his sons were Nagen Lezwe, Matan Matanzima, Sabada, who ruled the Thembu from 1954, was the grandson of Negengelezwe and a senior of Kalzor Dalawanga, better known as K.D. Matanzima, the former chief minister of the Transki, my nephew, by law and custom, who was a descendant of Matanzima. The eldest son of the Exiba house was Simakare, whose younger brother was Mandela, my grandfather. Although over the decades there have been many stories that I was in the line of succession to the Thimbu throne, the simple genealogy I have just outlined exposes those tales as a myth. Although I was a member of the royal household, I was not among the privileged few who were trained for rule. Instead, as a descendant of the Xiba house, I was groomed, like my father before me, to counsel the rulers of the tribe. My father was a tall, dark-skinned man with a straight and stately posture, which I like to think I inherited. He had a tuft of white hair just above his forehead, and as a boy, I would take white ash and rub it into my hair in imitation of him. My father had a stern manner and did not spare the rod when disciplining his children. He could be exceedingly stubborn, another trait that may unfortunately have been passed down from father to son. My father has sometimes been referred to as the Prime Minister of Thimbuland during the reigns of Dalanyebu, the father of Sabata, who ruled in the early 1900s, and that of his son, Jogan Taba, who succeeded him. That is a misnomer in that no such title existed, but the role he played was not so different from what the designation implies. As a respected and valued counselor to both kings, he accompanied them on their travels and was usually to be found by their sides during important meetings with government officials. He was an acknowledged custodian of Kausa history, and it was partially for that reason that he was valued as my advisor. My own interest in history had early roots and was encouraged by my father. Although my father could neither read nor write, he was reputed to be an excellent orator who captivated his audience by entertaining them as well as teaching them. In later years, I discovered that my father was not only an advisor to kings, but a kingmaker. After the untimely death of John Gilizue in the 1920s, his son, Sabata, the infant of the great wife, was too young to ascend to the throne. A dispute arose as to which of Dalanyebo's three most senior sons from other mothers, Jongantaba, Dabulamanzi, and Meletafa, should be selected to succeed him. My father was consulted and recommended Jagantamba on the grounds that he was the best educated. Jagantamba, he argued, would not only be a fine custodian of the crown, but an excellent mentor to the young prince, my father, and a few other influential chiefs, had the great respect for education that is often present in those who are uneducated. The recommendation was controversial, for Jagantaba's mother was from a lesser house, but my father's choice was ultimately accepted by both the Thembus and the British government. In time, Jogantaba would return the favor in a way that my father could not then imagine. All told, my father had four wives, the third of whom, my mother, Nosekeni Fani, the daughter of Nekendama from the Amenpumevu clan of the Kosa, belonged to the right-hand house. Each of these wives, the great wife, the right-hand wife, my mother, the left-hand wife, 
and the wife of a kadi or support house had her own kraal. A kraal was a homestead and usually included a simple fenced in enclosure for animals, fields for growing crops, and one or more thatched huts. The kraals of my father's wives were separated by many miles and he commuted among them. In these travels, my father sired 13 children in all, four boys and nine girls, and, I'm, and I am the eldest child of the right-hand house and the youngest of my father's four sons. I have three sisters, Balewe, who is the oldest girl, Nantaku, and Mahokutswana. Although the eldest of my father's sons was Lawa, my father, heir as chief of Dalik Kurili, the son of the great house who died in the early 1930s. All of his sons, with the exception of myself, are now deceased, and each was my senior, not only in age, but in status. When I was not much more than a newborn child, my father was involved in a dispute that deprived him of his chieftainship at Mevezo and revealed a strain in his character. I believed he passed on to his son. I maintain that nurture, rather than nature, is the primary molder of personality, but my father possessed a proud rebelliousness, a stubborn sense of fairness that I recognize in myself. As a chief or headman, as it was often known among the whites, my father was compelled to account for his stewardship, not only to be the Thembu king, but to the local magistrate. One day, one of my father's subjects lodged a complaint against him involving an ox that had strayed from its owner. The magistrate, accordingly, sent a message ordering my father to appear before him. When my father received the summons, he sent back the following reply. Andizi en de secula. I will not come. I am still girding for battle. One did not defy magistrates in those days. Such behavior would be regarded as the height of insolence. And in this case, it was. My father's response bespoke his belief that the magistrate had no legitimate power over him. When it came to tribal matters, he was guided not by the laws of the King of England, but by Thimbu custom. This defiance was not a fit of pique, but a matter of principle. He was asserting his traditional prerogative as a chief and was challenging the authority of the magistrate. When the magistrate received my father's response, he promptly charged him with insubordination. There is no inquiry or investigation that was reserved for white civil servants. The magistrate simply disposed my father, thus ending the Mandela family chieftainship. I was unaware of these events at the time, but I was not unaffected. My father, who was a wealthy nobleman by the standards of his time, lost both his fortune and his title. He was deprived of most of his herd and land and the revenue that came with them. Because of our straitened circumstances, my mother moved to Kunu a slightly larger village north of Mevizo, where she would have had the support of friends and relations. We lived in a less grand style in Kunu, but it was in that village near Umtata that I spent the happiest years of my boyhood, and whence I trace my earliest memories. The village of Kunu was situated in a narrow, grassy valley crisscrossed by clear streams and overlooked by green hills. It consisted of no more than a few hundred people who lived in huts, which were beehive-shaped structures of mud walls with a wooden pole in the center holding up a peaked grass roof. The floor was made of crushed ant heap, the hard dome of excavated earth above an ant colony, and was kept smooth by smearing it regularly with fresh cow dung. The smoke from the earth escaped through the roof, and the only opening was a low doorway one had to stoop to walk through. The huts were generally grouped together in a residential area that was some distance away from the maize fields. There were no roads, only paths through the grass worn away by barefooted boys and women. The women and children of the village wore blankets dyed in osher. Only the few Christians in the village wore Western-style clothing. Cattle, sheep, goats, and horses grazed together in common pastures. The land around Kunu was mostly treeless, except for a cluster of poplars, on a hill overlooking the village. The land itself was owned by the state, with very few exceptions. Africans at the time did not enjoy private title to land in South Africa, but were tenants paying rent annually to the government. In the area, there were two small primary schools, a general store, and a dipping tank to rid the cattle of ticks and diseases.
maize, what we called mealies and people in the West call corn, sorghum, beans, and pumpkins form the largest portion of our diet, not because of any inherent preference for these foods, but because the people could not afford anything richer. The wealthier families in our village supplemented their diets with tea, coffee, and sugar, but for most people in Kunu, these were exotic luxuries, far beyond their means. The water used for farming, cooking, and washing had to be fetched in buckets from streams and springs. This was women's work, and indeed, Kunu was a village of women and children. Most of them spent the greater part of the year working on remote farms or in the mines along the reef, the great ridge of gold-bearing rock and shale that forms the southern boundary of Johannesburg. They returned perhaps twice a year, mainly to plow their fields. The hoeing, weeding, and harvesting were left to the women and children. Few in any of the people in the village knew how to read or write, and the concept of education was still a foreign one to many. My mother presided over three huts at Kunu, which, as I remember, were always filled with the babies and children of many relations. In fact, I hardly recall any occasion as a child when I was alone. In African culture, the, so the sons and daughters of one's aunts or uncles are considered brothers and sisters, not cousins. We do not make the same distinctions among relations practiced by whites. We have no half-brothers or half-sisters. My mother's sister is my mother. My uncle's son is my brother. My brother's child is my son, my daughter. Of my mother's three huts, one was used for cooking, one for sleeping, and one for storage. In the hut in which we slept, there, were no, there was no furniture in, in the Western sense. We slept on mats and sat on the ground. I did not discover pillows until I went to Mekehesqueni. My mother cooked food in a three-legged iron pot over an open fire in the center of the hut or outside. Everything we ate, we grew and made ourselves. My mother planted a har and harvested her own mealies. Mealies were harvested from the field when they were hard and dry. They were stored in sacks or pits dug in the ground. When preparing the mealies, the women used different methods. They could grind the kernels between two stones to make bread or boil the mealies first, pr producing umpatulo, mealy flour eaten with sour milk, or umkusho, samp, sometimes plain or mixed with beans. Unlike mealies, which were sometimes in short supply, milk from our cows and goats was always plentiful. From an early age, I spent most of my free time in the veld playing and fighting with the other boys of the village. A boy who remained at home tied to his mother's apron strings was regarded as a sissy. At night, I shared my food and blanket with these same boys. I was no more than five when I became a herd boy, looking after sheep and calves in the fields. I discovered the almost mystical attachment that the Kusa have for cattle, not only as a source of food and wealth, but as a blessing from God and a source of happiness. It was in the fields that I learned how to knock birds out of the sky with a slingshot, to gather wild honey and fruits and edible roots, to drink warm water, sweet milk straight from the udder of a cow, to swim in the clear, cold streams, and to catch fish with twine and sharpened bits of wire. I learned to stick fight, essential knowledge to any rural African boy, and became adept at its various techniques. Pairing blows, fenting in one direction and striking in another, breaking away from an opponent with quick footwork. From these days, I date my love of the veld, of open spaces, the simple beauties of nature, the clean line of the horizon. As boys, we were mostly left to our own devices. We played with toys we made ourselves. We molded animals and birds out of clay. We made ox-drawn sleighs out of tree branches. Nature was our playground. The hills above Kunu were dotted with large, smooth rocks, which we transformed into our own roller coaster. We sat on the flat stones and slid down the face of the large rocks. We did this until our backsides were so sore we could hardly sit down. I learned to ride by sitting atop weaned calves. After being thrown to the ground several times, one got the hang of it. I learned my lesson one day from an unruly donkey. We had been taking turns climbing up and down its back, and when my chance came, I jumped on and the donkey bolted into a near, nearby thorn bush. It bent its head, trying to unseat me, which it did, but not before the thorns had pricked and scratched my face, embarrassing me in front of my friends. 
Like the people of the East, Africans have a highly developed sense of dignity, or what Chinese call face. I had lost face among my friends, even though it was a donkey that unseated me. I learned that to humiliate another person is to make him suffer an unnecessary cruel fate. Even as a boy, I defeated my opponents without dishonoring them.